Okay, so uh, so I've uh, put a provocative title. When will we have intelligent robots? But the reason why I have put this title is because we uh, we live in a time where great advances have happened in artificial intelligence, and you can read about it everywhere in the papers. But before we talk about artificial intelligence, we should talk about natural intelligence. And uh, this slide is trying to capture the biological history of natural intelligence. So it starts out about 550 million years ago when you have the first multicellular animals which could move and they could see. So the first setting of intelligence is that moving and seeing. Moving gives an animal lots of capabilities because it can now get food in different places. But then it needs to know where to go for which you need to have some form of perception. It could be vision, it could be other senses. And that combination is important. Gibson has this line, we see in order to move and we move in order to see. And the development of these two capabilities together and the connection of them which you can call intelligence is uh, when uh, brains start to take off, nervous systems start to take off. Not going to go through all the 550 million years, but suppose we get to the hominid line, humans uh, splitting off from primates. You have these major developments like the development of the opposable thumb, tool building, various forms. And then the, the, as manipulation develops and associated planning skills, the brain develops. There's this line from a Greek philosopher. It is because of his being armed with hands that man is the most intelligent of animals. And then we get to modern humans who came out of Africa about 50,000 years ago. And uh, maybe you have like Neanderthals a million years ago. And it's in this period that we get language, abstract thinking, and symbolic behavior. So if you think of intelligence as 24 hours, language is like the last two or three minutes. Now, uh, what has happened in the recent past, in the last couple of years, is that there have been spectacular advances in these uh, systems like ChatGPT and so forth, which everybody in the world knows about and is using. And they have these performance and things like law, the law school entrance exam in the US where they are performing at 90 percentile and so on. And the common public thinks of this as real intelligence. And so therefore the belief is, okay, intelligence is solved and, and wow, uh, this is amazing. And I want to uh, point out that not so fast, right? So think of this task of self-driving cars. This is, uh, the first versions of this were in the 1980s by this gentleman, Ernst Dickmanns in, uh, in Germany. He showed first driving on autobahns in like 1988 and so on. And by the mid 90s, there were many projects include in Europe and in the US and in Japan. Like for example, they had this drive from Berlin to Paris in like 95 or something like that. So what are we talking about 30 years ago, right? And there have been all these claims made about, oh, self-driving cars are here. Many, many companies have devoted billions of dollars. And as of yet, in, at least in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is the hub of technology, there's only one company left now, which is Waymo, uh, which is Google, okay, which has a successful taxi service. But, and this is something that a 16-year-old kid can do with like 20 hours of learning. Okay, so I want to point out the contradiction here, where we think of you know, preparing for the law school at entrance exam as like a big deal and a great test of intelligence, and that's being beaten regularly. And we can't do what I say any random 16-year-old can do. Okay, it can get worse. Here's what a 12-year-old can do. So th this is like a slide which has various activities that are performed in a kitchen. And a 12-year-old can use a knife, can slice onions, things like that, right? All of this can be done. No robot can do all this. So this is a apparent contradiction, but this is something which is known internally in the AI community and robotics community. And it has a name, a Morovex paradox. And uh, Hans Morovex, who was one of the early roboticists, he got his PhD at uh, Stanford and he built the first, there was this car, uh, first mobile robots basically. There's Shaky, but uh, Hans Morovex had a robot which actually could use stereo vision 
planned uh, paths through obstacles and so on. And he did this in 1980. And each picture would be taken, it would think for one hour and then it would take one step. <laughs> I mean, anyway, but the point uh, is captured in Pinker's slide. The main lesson of 35 years of AI research is that the hard problems are easy and the easy problems are hard. And, uh, and uh, so all these robotic type tasks are hard even though you know, a five-year-old kid can do them. And uh, some of these things which require specialized knowledge, you know, uh, or like, like chess or go or answering uh, law, law exam questions turn out to be easier. And the question of course is why is this so, right? So Hans Morawieck's uh, argument was, so he, he got the phenomena right, but I think his explanation may not have been right. His explanation was that these skills like moving and seeing which arose very early in evolutionary history, like five, five, even a, a fly has a perfectly good vision system and motor system, right? So you might argue that it is difficult for us as engineers to reverse engineer these skills which are very deep in evolution and it might be easier for us to talk about uh, you know the knowledge that is taken to needed to pass a law exam test. Uh, that was his argument. I do not quite buy that. I mean it is a plausible argument. I think a better argument is that of uh, data. Given how uh, AI has succeeded today. AI has succeeded today as machine learning and it is with huge data. So we have huge data in areas like speech, in vision, in language and that is what has enabled these big advances. In fact, we have data for these computer systems which is much, much more than what a human is capable, uh, uh, gets in their lifetime. I mean we can do these numbers for language where like about a trillion tokens have gone into these uh, language models like GPT-3 whereas a human child here is about like a million words a month, that is the usual estimate. So a 10 year old has heard a 100 million words. So 100 million words compared to a trillion tokens. So these systems have much, much more, uh, they need much more data for to be successful. Uh, now what is the data that would be needed for physical intelligence for robotics? It is the kind of data that uh, would correspond to knowing the nervous command, uh, the nerve system commands and the activations of the muscles or we could abstract it and talk about it as all the joint angles changing over time. And where do we have that data? I mean we do not, uh, we upload lots of photos on the web, every book is on the web, but I am not uploading my state of, my, 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 my state of joint angles to the web routinely. That is not, just not what I do and I am not likely to do. And then of course after that there will be an embodiment gap. My body is different from a robot's body and we may find ways to deal with that but the first problem is there is isn't that kind of data. So, so that is the challenge we have to confront and then there is a question of how we will get there. And uh, my talk is really about okay what are the ways to get there and uh, but first let us understand uh, Let us understand what are aspects of robotics which are unique to robotics and which are not just classic pattern recognition problems. So I am going to do this with this, uh, with this example. So this is uh, something from our work from a few couple of years ago and uh, this robot has a camera at the top and that is the view from the camera. It is an RGBD camera so that is the depth view. So there is no nothing else, there is no nothing being sent to a server, there is no motion capture system. The robot sees the world, it has to uh, solve this stepping stone task where if it makes a mistake it just falls down and breaks its bones. Uh, this is the robot in uh, outdoors climbing essentially stairs. You should be impressed by this because this robot has much smaller legs than a human. Okay? And all the sensing, computing, everything is on board. What you, what, okay? And uh, it has to deal with all these different environments, and it sees, and then, and then it acts.
Yeah. So this is just a psychological trick. When you see it struggling, you think it's more intelligent as a result. This is something in a staircase in CMU. Anyway, uh, you, you get the point. Uh, what is needed here is obviously versatility, dealing with many, many different environments, none of all of which cannot have been programmed in. And uh, okay, so that is the problem we are dealing with. So I want to make a distinction here, uh, or at least draw attention to the aspects of control theory and pattern recognition. So pattern recognition is the basic machinery of uh, modern machine learning or deep learning, right? Which is basically uh, uh, you have some x i y i pairs and we learn a function approximator and neural networks are fantastic function approximators and they work even though we do not understand how. Okay. Uh, generalization is a key problem which is generalization over pose, lighting, occlusion and so forth. Right? Or in speech it is generalization over different accents etc. But when we talk about robotics we are talking about uh, these motor control tasks which are basically feedback systems right they have been designed as feedback systems and control theorists are the people who have studied these and here uh, control systems are designed to be robust to disturbances the, the, your system estimate will be wrong there will be you, you will not know what is exactly happening but you will sense and you will you will do the right thing this robustness is very important. I would also argue that adaptation is very important. Adaptation uh, meaning that your robot has to walk in many, many different conditions, flat ground, slopes, soft sand, hard ground, etc. So how do we think about it? So uh, I mean this is an area, I mean this is uh, goes back years, but I, I really like the era of the 1950s and early 60s where a lot of fundamental research happened in this area. So the term uh, you know, artificial intelligence was coined in the 50s, cybernetics is from that era, optimal control is from that era and I have some uh, names here of uh, these leading traditions right, uh, in uh, control theory which at one time these were all unified and then in the 70s and so on they split off. So the EE people focused on control theory, the CS people focused on sort of AI symbolic type approaches. But uh, I, I, I think today we are unifying all these traditions together with the tools that we have today. So, uh, the op, uh, so this x dot equals ax plus e, bu, I mean this is your canonical control theory class uh, 001 uh, formulation. It is a linear model, right? x is the state of the system which corresponds for a robot to all the joint angles let us say and A is a matrix and then U is some control, so some vector of inputs. And then for this you can figure out, define an optimal control problem and solve it. What is going on with reinforcement learning is exactly the same formulation except that the, the is you, we do not analytically write down the solution, but we figure it out by search in some way. Now that by itself would not give you, if, if you had only that sort of a simple system, you would not get any mileage out of using reinforcement learning. The mileage comes in a setting which for the control theorists uh, is a classical problem called adaptive control. So in adaptive control you have that, that same equation, but you say that this matrix A changes over time. So the canonical, I have read up a bit of the history of this field in, from the 60s. The canonical example for them was flying an airplane. So you are flying an airplane, now as the airplane flies over time, uh, its fuel is used up so it becomes lighter. So it, the mass is less, so therefore that A matrix has changed. So if you use the same control law which is meant for a heavy plane versus a light plane, you are getting into trouble. So, so the classic control theorist way of doing this is to design different controllers for different regimes and then stitch them together. So for example, Boston Dynamics is robots. So they are, I, they may have changed things recently, but at least in the old days they would build controllers using what is called MPC, model predictive control. But in that style you build many different controllers and you use the right one at the right time. 
So, you have one controller for going upstairs, one for ground, one for going down, etc., etc. Uh, now, neural networks give us a much more greater flexibility because now instead of this matrix A, we can have some arbitrary function. So, and we can have these change smoothly over time. So, basically, the ideas from pattern recognition, which are this flexible function approximation, and these ideas from control theory, they can kind of be merged together. We can no longer do analytically, uh, we cannot analytically write down the optimal controller, but we can find the optimal controller through search and reinforcement learning. So, this is the big picture to have in mind for how robotics is going to get solved in the new era. And I really believe that this will work. I think in, a, in 5 years, 10 years, we will solve robotics and we are going to solve it this way. Okay, so, then the next challenge becomes uh, uh, how are we going to do this reinforcement learning search. Because if you have a real robot and you subject it to a billion trials, the hardware is not going to survive. right? Now, the human hardware also does uh, uh, learning with trial and error. So, I have talked with people who study children learning to walk. So, it turns out children fall a lot. They might, a child who is learning to walk may fall thousands of times. Okay? But thousands of times is different from millions of times. And the child's body is very well adapted uh, uh, because they have a soft body, they have a low center of gravity, they fall, does not damage them. Okay? Our robots different. So, because we have not as efficient learning algorithms and not as efficient and uh, not as good bodies as humans, we will have to put some put in some some practice. Okay. So, uh, I, th I think that with this by background, uh, so what is the answer to this? So, the answer to this is instead of doing the experiments in the real world, the trial and error which reinforcement learning is all about, you do the experiments in a simulator. So, there is a lot of debate about this. Some people just hate simulators. My colleague Alyosha Efros is an example of, of that. But I feel that there is no choice that right now because the, the learning compl sample complexity of reinforcement learning is very high, we cannot do it in the real world for many of these tasks. Humans can. So, that means that there is at some point we will figure it out, but we have not figured it out yet. And a simulator is basically capturing the dynamics of the system, and we and and we can build very good simulators because the physics is all well known, right? I mean the physics is Newtonian mechanics. I mean we know it well, and physics simulators are good. I mean right now a lot of physics simulators are used for, example, for designing airplanes and things like that. And simulators can work even in settings where you cannot write things down analytically, because they are because you, we can simulate at the micro level always. Simulators for optics have worked because that is how we have such beautiful renderings for movies. So, why not in this end? There is a problem which is that which is called the sim to real problem and that problem is that how do you get the right parameters? How do you know the right friction? How do you know the right physics parameters? How do you know the right torque of the motor? So, there is and this is a mismatch between the reality and what is in your simulator. So, this is called the sim to real gap and we have to figure out a way to solve that. And so, let me get to that. So, uh, I will start with this paper which is slightly old, but in that some one of the key ideas uh, gets developed. We have this term for this uh, rapid motor adaptation. So, let me just explain the architecture here. So, uh, so we have this robot which is going. We are eventually we are trying to train a policy which is the controller, and the input to this policy is the state x, which corresponds to all the joint angles, actions, which are the actions that have been taken before, and there's a history. So you have this past state and history, and then you 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 give the command which is what's the next action, which means what are the next set of joint angles that you want and that is fed to some low level PD controller. And uh, okay, so far so good, but then there is this variable z. So, this z is the canonical term for latent variable which is used in all the machine learning literature. So, in my case what I mean by z is characteristics of the environment. 
So my robot has to walk on flat ground, it has to walk in sand, it has to walk upstairs, downstairs. So that so, if I was a classic control theorist, I would say x dot equals a x plus b u, but my a is changing that matrix a is changing and that a is changing with this latent variable z sub t. Okay. So, 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 that so, you see the need for that input which will capture the variation in the different environments. So, now then the question is okay, how do I know this z? Right, so now I have just transferred the problem. So, I, okay, so, so this has to be estimated online, and, uh, and the idea is that the z itself is revealed by the past history over a longer time frame. So, there is a short time frame, like 100 hertz, at which you are giving commands to the motors of the robot, but there is a longer time frame over which you can deduce whether you are walking on hard concrete or you are walking on sand. Why? Because if I give the same sequence of commands as I am walking, so I walk here does not take much force to lift up my foot. If I am walking on sand, if I am on beach in a beach, I put my foot down it gets pressed, then when I lift my foot up if I apply the same force it would not come out, it will come out only part of the way. So, the the behavior of the system given the same input, but resulting in different output actually reveals aspects of the physical environment. So, that is the z. So, we call this the adaptation module which just has to use a longer history of state and action. So, this may be needs like a second okay. and, uh, and, and that is what the controller will be. So, there is a controller which is the low level controller and then there is like a meta controller which is deducing which is inferring what state uh, what kind of environment you are in and, and that is different z's. And now the challenge is that this whole system has to be trained in simulation and we, we find a way to train this in simulation. In simulation the way we train it is that we have access to the ground truth and so, we can create many different conditions which will correspond to different z's. So, you will have conditions of low friction, high friction uh, etcetera etcetera and it learns to walk in each of those conditions and then we can train this adaptation module also in simulation. Okay. So, yeah. no visual so, so, this, this, uh, this diagram is for a, a blind robot, we have, we have over time built a series of robots and the, our first robots were blind and the reason was that because I can walk blind right. So, uh, it turns out that we, we can do 90 percent of the time we do not need vision, there are times when you need vision and I will come to that, but our first few robots were blind and then we added vision. The robot that you saw which was going on the stools that was a visual robot. So, uh, so I, I want to just uh, indicate like uh, show you this uh, this idea this uh, this adaptation using the latent with this example. So, we have uh, so these experiments were done during the pandemic. So, my student Ashish Kumar this is his home okay, and he what he did was he just took the robot home and he worked uh, day and night. <laughs> so, here he's poured olive oil on the on this uh, mattress. And in fact, if you look at the feet of the robot, those have plastic on them. So, the robot starts to slip and then it manages to walk. Okay. So, okay. so now this, this shows what is happening, uh, 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 but uh, okay. so this is an explanation of what is happening. So, you see these two curves that you see these are two of those, uh, so z is a 8 dimensional vector in our case and these, uh, these two curves at the bottom uh, the red and blue curve they correspond to the value of z. So, what is happening is that the, uh, the, the, the dog initially sort of struggles because it has got the wrong parameters because and it starts to slip o over time, over time meaning like within a second this z gets estimated correctly that okay, now the friction coefficient is much lower. 
which is implicitly captured in the values of z. So, you see this red curve which comes down and so on. And now, uh, as a result, uh, the, the, the policy moves smoothly to this other regime. At the top, what you see are the uh, uh, right, uh, right leg, right. Uh, so, those correspond to, to the various footfalls of the four legs, uh, which one, one of them is on the ground or not. So, front left, front right, rear left, rear right, those are those top four rows. So, th th that is it, that is the idea. Uh, now, let me show you some uh, other cool things which emerge in this kind of a framework as opposed to the classical MPC framework. Uh, for example, we can, uh, it is learning by trial and error, okay. Now, but what you do is you specify the cost function, you specify the reward function. And uh, in this case, it is minimizing energy. And we give it target speed. So, we can say walk at 0.375 meters per second, okay. So, it get develops a gate like this. Or, and then you can see which feet are on the ground. This RF, LF, these are the four feet. Then you specify a slightly higher speed, a different gate develops. And then if you give it uh, even greater requirement, Okay, you get this galloping behavior. We, this, this was not specified. This emerges. Okay, this emerges with the only specification is go at a certain go at this desired speed, and and this is of course something that people in biomechanics had realized earlier, and that different gates are efficient at different uh, 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 efficient in the sense of use minimum and uh, use the minimum energy. Uh, for different uh, target speeds. And uh, there is this experiment here which is uh, on horses where they computed the metabolic costs and different gates emerge when you when they go at uh, different speeds. Okay. For humans, when we are at low speeds walking is efficient, when we are at high speeds running is efficient. It is the same phenomena, but it did not have to be programmed in. We did not program in any gates. The gates emerge by just this process of trial and error search for which the fancy name is reinforcement learning. Okay. And now, uh, so, so you can do a lot with blind walking, but if you have to go on, on these very complex terrain, then blind walking does not work. And that is what we show here. And I already showed you the video for this. And uh, this is the, the paper, which is at Coral 2022. And here, uh, the Main insight is that the same general architecture works. So, there are some observations and then we are estimating this z, but in addition we estimate something called gamma. So, gamma is for the geometry, I mean the Greek letter for g, right. So, so we from an RGBD camera you estimate some parameters of the geometry and those are used for foot placement and this is all trained in simulation. And the uh, from uh, the z captures things like friction and physics parameters, and uh, that's what enabled that demo which I with which I started the talk. Okay, uh, now uh, that was uh, that was walking. Uh, okay, now let me show you um, a manipulation task. So this is uh, a multi-fingered hand with four fingers, which is rotating an object. And uh, what is supposed to be noteworthy here is that these are all many different objects with different mass, different shape, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but we have the same policy, so the controller is adaptive. It does the right thing with for these different objects, okay? And it, it and this has no touch, no vision, okay? It's blind. It's but blind is not blind really because if you ha always have proprioception, you have knowledge about all the joint angles and humans make a lot of use of this. So, one of my biggest discoveries when I switched from being a vision researcher to a robotics researcher was that there is so much more to sensing than computer than vision. Because you vision people are chauvinists, we just think that this is the most important sense. But there are all these other senses. So, you are always aware of all the joint angles in the body, that is proprioception, that is very important. Okay. Uh, so, this is what uh, this shows. Okay. So, this was our first result and I am trying to show that we can do all these different objects. Okay. 
Now, this approach uh, looked, uh, it was always rotating about the z axis. Now, it turns out this is the easier version of the problem. Rotating about the vertical is easier. If you try to rotate about other axes, it becomes harder. So, the simple approach that we used, which we, the only sensing was proprioception, did not work. And, uh, and the answer to all robotics problems, in my view, is when you're, it does not work, add more sensing. And always, uh, and here, what is the obvious thing to do? Add vision. So, put in a camera so that you are looking at the object and add touch. So, make the fingertips with tactile sensing so you can feel the uh, detect when some object is pressing against the finger. So, uh, it turns out that that works basically. And uh, so, here is the proof I am going to play the video soon, but uh, what you see are I mean in this uh, th this axis they show what is the axis of rotation. So, minus 1 0 0 means that it is rotating about the x axis okay, clockwise or counterclockwise that is what the sign is. Uh, the, the third row is basically rotation about the z axis and the second row is uh, rotation about the y axis and then in the fourth row we show you can pick an arbitrary ro axis of rotation. And we want to generalize over uh, all these different object sizes. So, so, the point is that this works, right? Uh, that is what this demo shows. Okay. And uh, the way the technique works is that the computer vision part of it is that you have an object in the hand. So, you segment out the object from the fingers and now we have good segmentation techniques. And then for the tactile, we have the, the fingers, we have inside it there is a, a tactile sensor. That is important. Uh, so, it turns out that uh, basically you need to vary the aspect ratio of the objects inside. So, it, but, uh, but like a cylinder is a pretty good object to learn to rotate. If you only gave it spheres, it would not work. So, what matters really is roughly speaking, what is the equivalent ellipsoid that matters and then there is the softness and, uh, and the lightness or heaviness of the object. So, those are the parameters you vary. So, this is important otherwise we would fail. The, it, I, I, I think of it as uh, the physical situation has many, many parameters, but all those parameters actually do not matter. There is a low dimensional action space which is good enough, because there is a low dimensional physical equivalence that is good enough. Right? I will give you another example. Uh, this is from fluid mechanics. So, in fluid mechanics, we have these uh, various numbers, Reynolds number, Froude number, Prandtl number, etcetera. These are dimensionless constants which capture things like ratio of velocity, viscosity, etcetera. And if you preserve those, you can have the same essentially physical situation. That is why we can do experiments in uh, wind tunnels, which are not exactly the same condition as uh, out in the real world, because the physical conditions are equivalent. So, that is what is going on here. The physical world in fact has, uh, it is very complex, but it is actually low dimensional. This was a great insight from, uh, uh, and then a human action similarly has all these degrees of freedom, but actually is low dimensional. There was this uh, uh, great uh, Soviet uh, scientist in motor control, who I think is the really is the most important figure in motor control in the entire 20th century called Nikolai Bernstein. And Nikolai Bernstein had this term called synergy, which in our current modern terminology will just say low degrees of freedom like PCA or some nonlinear version. And this is what will save us. Because when we learn actions, we do not really have to get, it is not really a 200 dimensional space, it is a lower dimensional space. So, uh, how do we do this? Uh, we have a, a, a policy which we train and it turns out to be quite mirror, quite similar to what we did for walking, where at training time you have a ground truth. So, you know things like uh, the shape of the object, you know things like physics parameters. So, that is the top row. At training time you make the problem easier by setting, by, by having a control setting where you know the object shape you know the physics parameters, you know the pose. 
And with this privileged encoder, you get a ZT and you have a control policy which works. And then at training time, you, you're going to have to work just from the observations. But what you do is you train from the observations a way to estimate the Z. And then uh, here's a nice result, which is uh, uh, what's the value of all the sensing? So the performance here is how long can you keep rotating? So higher is better. So, the, uh, so this is what you do if you don't have vision or touch on the leftmost. Uh, this is what you do if you give the, the policy ground truth knowledge of the shape of the object. Okay? And uh, this is, these two correspond to one is just using vision, one is just using touch. And here what you have is using vision and touch together. So the intuitive result is that you expect that both these senses help and they are complementary because vision works even when, uh, when the object is not occluded. Uh, that's when it works best. But when the object is occluded, it's in contact with the fingers, in which case touch helps most. So the two are sort of complementary. So, uh, okay. Uh, now I'll show you results where, uh, on more challenging scale. So this is work from the last couple of years. But now, uh, so in my view, quadrupeds is like done. Quadruped locomotion, I think we have solved it. I mean, not just we, but other groups also have. Uh, this is really quite robust and real. You, you, okay. A biped is harder because walking with two feet is the stability problem is more challenging. But this is what we need if we want to solve humanoids. And then I, I did a rotation with one hand as a task. I'll, what about two hands? Because my, I believe that the future of robotics is with humanoids, with multi-fingered hands, like just like humans. Because the advantage is that in the home, uh, you, the environment is made for humans. Okay. So if you put a humanoid robot, then everything is set up correctly. Okay. The, the, now it is much more challenging to program them, but I think we'll solve that problem. In the next few years, that problem will be solved. So first I want to show you uh, this uh, results on real world humanoid locomotion. I mean, again, I, I want you to note the comparison with the old style way of doing this. Boston Dynamics has been doing this for decades with teams of hundreds of people. The stuff that I'm showing here is with teams of four students, right, in a year. Okay, and this is the power of sort of uh, learning and uh, compute and all the rest of it. So this is our uh, biped robot. This is the so-called digit robot walking around in Berkeley. So it can walk backwards. Now of course, you should also see that when this is, there's much more popular interest. You know, where people come around, they all want to take selfies, etc., which messes up our, uh, you know, images that we have. So anyway, these are all with the same policy, okay? Okay, here what we did was, uh, the insight was the following. In the previous work, you, what you saw was this two-stage process. So there is this basic policy, which is conditioned on Z, and then there is this separate module which estimates Z, which is based on a longer history. So what if you put in a more powerful uh, learning architecture? for which the answer is transformers. Everything in uh, computer vision or near, uh, all the different areas of deep learning, all these different architectures have all switched over time to transformers. The answer is it's all, every paper, every problem which we have solved with other techniques will now eventually be solved with transformers. So why not here? So we did that here. And the, the, the idea is you need a longer history because otherwise you can't estimate these latent variables. But if you give that, opportunity in your learning architecture, then you wouldn't need to have two stages. And that's what you see here. So this causal transformer, there is observation, action, observation, action. You take an action, now that goes in. So you always have this fixed window of the past that you are, uh, you are feeding to this transformer. It outputs what action you have. The action here is uh, also includes like gains for these PD controllers, and, and that's it. 
So in some sense, uh, that's all there is. The, well, there is a lot more detail than that. But and with that, we are able to build this. Uh, and it's a zero shot transfer to the real world. So uh, yeah. So my uh, answer to this problem of sim to real is we can solve sim to real if you adapt and uh, adaptation is needed from real to real as well so basically once you build the appropriate adaptation mechanism it will deal with the sim to real part i will actually show you where it learns this so this is a this is a demo which shows okay so you see that it had to change its okay and now uh, if you look at, uh, this is one of the states of the neural network. So this hidden state in that output layer, uh, the, this hidden state 108, you can see that it changes during that phase. And you can also take the, that whole, uh, that whole ac uh, uh, action vector and basically you can project it to two dimensions with PCA or TSNI. And you can see that during the, the stage where it's going down slope, uh, the the it, it's in a different part of the space. So the 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 thing is that this this transformer model has learned to deal with these different situations all as part of this architecture, and we can ex extract that signature. So it is adapting. So we didn't have to put in two separate stages. It's all happening in that one machinery. And then with all of these, you have to give these demos. Right? that it's robust. So control requires that you show robustness. OK, so now I'll show you a task which is, uh, which is quite challenging, which is uh, uh, nobody has demonstrated this with robots in general. So you, you, you're twisting the lid of a bottle with two hands. So we're going to have so two hands. That is challenging because you have to coordinate. We have two multi-fingered hands, which uh, makes it harder than just a parallel jug gripper. And the task is to remove the top of a bottle, but it could be any bottle. Okay, and we train this in simulation, and then zero shot it works. So, uh, so let's uh, let's see it. So these are demos of uh, of different kinds of bottles. And anyway, it went through too fast, and I should have a more magnified version. But the point is. This is works. This gives you a little flavor of the setup. So this is quite. Uh, so we have these Allegro hands. So in this one, we have no tactile sensing, but we have a camera, which is looking at it. Uh, so the the vision part is, uh, is specialized for this configuration. So these are basically axis aligned cylinders, which are being estimated, but the two hands have to work together to twist the lids. And uh, the middle part shows that it generalizes over many different bottles of slightly different uh, sizes and shapes and friction properties and so on. So the training was done with those four objects. And then these were all what were used in testing. OK. Uh, now I want to get a little bit philosophical, which is uh, how to think about robotics and uh, in the context of child development. So this is my uh, favorite uh, quote for me. It goes back to Turing. So Turing in that 1950 paper which proposed the Turing test has a paragraph which says, instead of trying to produce a program to simulate the adult mind, why not try to produce one which simulates the child's and then subject it to an appropriate course of education. And uh, over the last uh, you know, 70 years, we know a lot about how children learn. And here's a slide from Smith and Gasser, these are child psychologists. And uh, they have, uh, based on all their experimental work, there are some insights into how the various stages of child development in the first few years. And uh, there are some characteristics. Multimodal, use many senses. Incremental, meaning that you have some kind of a curriculum. You learn one skill, and then you build on top of that skill. Physical, you act in the world, explore. Social, you learn from others by imitation, use language. So. Uh, so in my view, this actually gives me a lot of guidance in terms of what problems to pursue. So let's take this idea. I, I, I have I've, I've picked a few examples. So one is incremental, which means that you have skills 
and then other skills are layered on top of other skills. So this task is the task of pursuit evasion. This is a classic problem in control theory, differential games. But let me show you what pursuit evasion is with this. Okay, so this robot, so we have walking policies already and on top of it there is this camera and this robot is the pursuer and, uh, uh, and uh, is trying to chase uh, Antonio's girlfriend. And, and she is uh, doing evasive behavior, she will go hide behind a tree, come, you know, okay, et cetera, et cetera, okay. 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 <laughs> anyway, you, you, you got the, so let me go back to what the research problems here are. So there are several problems here that, so what we did was we trained this policy also completely in simulation, this pursuit evasion policy in a simulator where the things which emerge are, first you have to seek information. So if you don't know where the person is, where the target is, you have to move around and look in different directions like this. Then when you chase, you don't want to chase to where the person is now, but where the person will be. And so you have to do a prediction. So, uh, so, so all of this has to be learned, in, which is learned in simulation. So basically there is a second order behavior of pursuit evasion, assuming that you have the skill of walking. So I think that there is a lot of this going on in childhood. You acquire some basic skills and skills on top of that, on top of that. Control is in that sense uh, very, it has to be hierarchical, okay. Okay, uh, okay, so, okay, so these are just different settings and we can have the robot chase another robot, etc., etc. Okay. Okay, uh, I won't say much on this, but we, we saw uh, also this problem of uh, navigating to all. So the task here is, we, we did this experiment, uh, this is with a, a, a traditional mobile robot. So this is the Airbnb test. So the Airbnb test is, you walk in, you've just rented an Airbnb, so you do not have a map of it. You open the door, you put the robot down, and then you say, go to the television set. So we actually did this experiment on these different homes. So what it has to do is to, it has to move, it's going to map the environment, it's going to uh, go to the television or to the toilet or to the kitchen or whatever. And it works remarkably well. And it turns out that end-to-end -end training is not the right answer. Doing it in this two-level way works best. And we, uh, yeah. So, so, and it, it is not, the, the solution is not SLAM. It does not build a complete map. It builds a partial map. So map making is important, but it can be partial because you do not need the entire map environment mapped in a detailed way. But map making prevents you from looping uh, unnecessarily. Okay, let me give you an example of social, which is uh, learning to imitate object. This is, uh, to me, is the, uh, is the richest area, which is uh, when we, if you can take videos, because where do we, we do have tons of data is internet videos. So if we can take these videos and 3Dify them, 3Dify the hand, 3Dify the object, okay? Like, like this, right? So you're, you're, you're showing the from different viewpoint. And this capability, the vision part of it is not solved yet. We have this demos, but these are ones where we select, we knew in advance a CAD model of the object. We have some ongoing work right now, which is aimed at making this totally automatic. When that succeeds, which I'm actually pretty sure will happen within like less than a year. And there are many groups working on this. Then essentially we can take internet videos of people performing actions, convert them to 3D of hand and, uh, and object, and then uh, you have to find a way to transfer that to the robot. But this to me is a very pr promising one. So this is just like all the videos we have been able to 3D find. Okay, I, I want to, uh, this is my final few minutes. I, I want to make some sweeping remarks about uh, home robots versus home computers. I'm quite optimistic on home robots. To me, that's the reason why I got into robotics. I think robots for the assembly line and uh, 
Amazon warehouses, enough people have worked on them. I'm interested in robots for the home. And I want, and I believe that they should be humanoid type robots with multi-fingered hands. And uh, when will this happen? It will happen when they are cheap enough. And they'll be cheap enough when uh, they are, they have to be cheap enough, which is, and they have to have applications that people can use. And then more applications can just keep being developed. That's how the personal computer came. In the 1980s, you had like three applications, word processing, spreadsheets, and games. And then, of course, many, many more. And the similar thing for the phone. OK, so I have uh, this last set of videos, which are there's a recent paper where what we have done is, uh, uh, as I said, I'm totally a believer that what we need is multi-fingered hands with tactile and so on. And I'll just show you, uh, forget the technical part. So uh, we, had, we here, uh, what we did was we, we trained with human demonstrations. But what you will see is not teleop, but real operation. So this is a multi-fingered, so this, these are, these you are two arms, there's a multi-fingered hand. In, on that hand, there's some tactile sensing. And let's see what it can do. So it, it is automat uh, it's automatic, it's not a, a tele-operation. Okay, next example. These are things you cannot do with one hand, so we had to wanted to show that. Here's another example. So this is again like a, there's a stack which has to be put on the other, and this is uh, uh, this couldn't be done if you didn't have uh, uh, with uh, a parallel jaw grip. Okay, these tasks are very, very hard, and I'm not going to say that, okay, this problem is solved. It'll take us some time. But this gives you a flavor of when you will have robots in the home which can do all these things, which can move around in the home, uh, na navigate. Uh, that's when we'll have you, the true meaning of the word robot. Thank you very much. <laughs>